Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 20. Witchcraft in Tudor, England. If any person, or persons, after the first day of May next coming, use, devise, practice, or exercise any invocations or conjurations of sprites, witchcraft, enchantments, or sorceries, to the intent to get or find money or treasure, to waste, consume, or destroy any person in his body members or goods, or to provoke any person to unlawful love, or for any other unlawful intent or purpose, or by occasion or colour of such things, or any of them, or for despite of Christ, or for the lustre of money, to dig up or pull down any cross or crosses, or by such witchcrafts take upon them to tell or declare where goods stolen or lost shall be, that then all and every such offence or offences from the said first day of May next coming shall be deemed accepted and adjudged felony, and that all and every person or persons offending as the above said their counsellors, abettors or procurers, and every of them from the said first day of May shall be deemed accepted and adjudged a felon and felons. And the offender and offenders contrary to this act being thereof lawfully convicted, before such shall have the power and authority to hear and determine felonies, shall have and suffer such pains of death, losses and forfeitures of their lands, tenants and goods and chattels, as in cases of felony by the course of the common laws of this realm, and also shall lose privilege of clergy and sanctuary. A uh, long excerpt from the 1542 Act Against Conjurations, Witchcrafts, Sorceries and Enchantments. Welcome back to the History of Witchcraft podcast. Last week we took a look at the magical artefacts and superstitions of Rome, and consider the extent to which these cultural and legal precedents might have influenced later theological and judicial thought. This week, we leave the ancient world behind and return to the early modern era. Religious wars, political persecutions, the very air rich with paranoia and the ashes of unfortunate individuals. Ah, it's good to be back. These next few episodes will be familiar, and not just because of the time period. We will be returning to the Sceptred Isle, Great Britain, which we have already visited previously in both the mini-series on the life of James VI of Scotland, as well as the guest episode on David Crowther's History of England podcast. As I promised during that guest episode, and immediately after on this show, I've returned to cover Tudor and Stuart England in greater detail. As such, if you've listened to the guest episode over at the History of England, there may be some repetition, so while I promise that there is also a great deal of new information, Please forgive me if I don't precede every repeated phrase by pointing out that it is in fact repeated. If you haven't listened to it, then I suggest you do, I'm very proud of it. And while you're there, you might as well have a listen to David's back catalogue of 230 episodes and change. It may take you a while, but it is certainly worth it. Over the next few episodes, we'll be covering not just Tudor England in greater detail, but also continuing the timeline both north and south of the border. I left off James's story just as he inherited the throne of England from the childless Elizabeth. Events in both kingdoms continue to be of interest to us. It is under James and his son Charles's reign that both suffer terrible witch panics, with England's single worst hunt taking place during a little scuffle called the English Civil War. Scotland doesn't get off easy either, holding a series of hunts from the Civil War until the end of the 17th century. So today we will begin with a re-examination of early Tudor England, by which I mean the reigns of Henry VIII, Edward VI, and Mary I. Thankfully for the denizens of Tudor England, but rather disappointingly for this podcast, they were largely spared any kind of mass trial, as could be found in abundance on the continent. Yet the English were just as religious and superstitious as their continental neighbours, and none more so than the bloody beast himself, Henry VIII. Famous for his penchant for feasting, hunting, and wives, Henry was most certainly a brave man, at least against threats which he could see and fight, but he also appears to have been absolutely terrified of invisible dangers, be they divine wrath, illness, poison, or witchcraft. When plague reared its ugly head, he bravely turned his tail and fled. Yes, brave King Henry turned about and gallantly he chickened out. Bravest of the brave, King Henry. <laughs> 
Whenever plague or illness appeared in London, Henry would find any excuse to be anywhere else, and when his future wife, Anne Boleyn, the woman he would break with papal authority over, caught a fever, he comforted her from a safe distance by letter. Famously, his public reason for desiring his divorce with Catherine of Aragon, his first wife and mother to Mary, was that he believed his marriage to be cursed, that God was punishing him for marrying his brother Arthur's wife. Now, how much he genuinely believed that is unclear, but the king's great matter, as the divorce was euphemistically called, would be something of a catalyst for the tension between the king and his subjects. You see, it wasn't as simple as saying, Look, Kate, darling, I think we're cursed. You haven't given me a son, and as much as I love our daughter, she's just not up to snuff, and if she inherits, the kingdom will descend into another War of the Roses. So let's give this whole marriage thing a rest, shall we? You go off to a nunnery, and I'll get hitched to another woman. Sounds good? It did not, as it were, sound good to Catherine. She was the king's lawful wife, and not only that, her family were powerful. Her father was the King of Aragon, while her nephew Charles was the Holy Roman Emperor. Both monarchs could apply immense pressure to the Pope to deny Henry's wish for a divorce, especially when Charles physically imprisoned the Holy Father. But to avoid getting bogged down in the details, and if you want the full story, go listen to the History of England, Henry wanted a divorce. The Pope wouldn't let him, and so Henry began down the path to breaking the English Church from papal authority. Now, such a revolutionary march against a religious institution over a millennia old was not taken lightly, and notable opposition came from all corners of the kingdom. From bishops like John Fisher, to Chancellor Thomas More, to low-born nuns like Elizabeth Barton, the Holy Maid of Kent. It is the opposition of Fisher, that firebrand papal loyalist that is of immediate concern to us, however. David has repeatedly said that Fisher is unjustly overshadowed by his fellow martyr, Thomas More, and the way he tells it, I'm inclined to agree. Fisher did seem to genuinely care for the spiritual well-being of his flock, eschewing much of the pageantry and wealth that his peer bishop liked to frolic in, <coughs> Cardinal Wolsey, <coughs> but he was also fervently opposed to any criticism of reforming the Catholic Church. The idea of lay people, even a king, telling the church how would the church should be run, made his blood boil. This was for the Pope and the church fathers to decide, no one else. So imagine how incensed Fisher became as Henry, unwilling to accept the papal refusal to annul his marriage, started getting too big for his britches, and this is Henry VIII, remember, so his britches were very big. Fisher began to actively oppose the king's attempts to become the head of the church within his kingdom, an act that Henry considered to be treason as well as appealing to the Holy Roman Emperor to invade and depose Henry, an act that was most certainly treasonous. Fisher would eventually be executed for his intransigence on Tower Hill in 1535, but of interest to us is an event that took place five years previously. In 1530, Fisher was already a vocal opponent of the King's Great Matter, perhaps his most famous opponent at that. So when Fisher narrowly avoided being poisoned alongside his household, some of whom died and others never truly recovered, suspicion immediately focused on either Henry or his wife-to-be, Anne Boleyn. The actual poisoner, Richard Roos, a cook in the employ of Fisher, was arrested at the scene, but he maintained his story that he thought what he'd spiked the gruel with was just a laxative, as a joke. If Henry or Anne had given the order for the poisoning, they made sure to look squeaky clean after the fact. Roos was tortured relentlessly, given an act of attainder, and judged guilty without even facing a trial. While this was going on, Henry had Parliament pass the 1530 Poisoning Act, which made it an act of treason to kill anyone with poison rather than it just being murder, with the punishment, of course, being death. Oddly, the usual punishment for treason, that of hanging, drawing, and quartering, was replaced with death by boiling and so Roos was duly boiled alive. The reason I bring up this case is for a couple of reasons. The first is as an example of Henry's character. He hated and feared poisoning. You couldn't fight it, or shout it down, or bend it to your will. He would later, while Anne Boleyn was facing her own trial, confide in his bastard son that he believed she had planned to poison both himself and Mary, although how true this belief was, and whether Henry really believed it himself, is again up for debate. 
Berlin has also been accused of being a witch herself at times, but to put it simply, this was just slander directed at her by her enemies. Cardinal Wolsey had faced the same accusations due to his influence over the king. In the eyes of his enemies, this up-jumped commoner held far too much power, and he must have the king under some kind of spell. That spell turned out to be his highly efficient and effective governance, but that hardly soothed a noble pride, so slander it was. Now, Henry's zealous prosecution of Roos was most likely an attempt to clear his own reputation for the attempted poisoning, but even so, he didn't need to go half as far as he did. Henry could have judged him guilty and had him executed for murder, and would have comfortably distanced himself from the crime. Instead, he went through the trouble of convicting Roos with an act of attainder, passing a new law making poisoning treason, and declaring the execution would be much more severe even than the most infamous of executions, the hanging, drawing, and quartering. This would, however, be in line with Henry's genuine hatred of invisible threats such as poisoning and magic. The other reason is that, as we've learned over the last few episodes on the ancient world, poisoning and witchcraft have historically been aligned, and were too in the early modern era. Many accusations were levelled at midwives and other informal medical professionals, who made use of herbs and medicines that could either have unfortunate side effects, or be unable to cure the patient, both of which opened them up to charges of poisoning. Staying with the laws for the moment, the very first English statute dealing with and defining witchcraft came about under Henry's reign. In 1542, Parliament passed the Act Against Conjurations and Witchcrafts and Sorceries and Enchantments, an excerpt of which I read at the beginning of the episode. This act specified exactly what constituted a crime of witchcraft, and brought the prosecution of this crime firmly into secular courts by depriving individuals of spiritual safeguards, such as that of sanctuary and the benefit of clergy. Both this act, as well as the Poisoning Act, would be repealed on Henry's death by his son Edward, which we'll get to in a moment. But going back quite a bit, before Henry's final break with Rome, we have an interesting case of prophecy. Elizabeth Barton, the Holy Maid of Kent, rather famously began to receive visions at the age of 19 while working as a servant for a farmer, after she was struck down with a severe illness. These visions appeared to predict future events, such as the death of local children, and Barton began to preach to her community on the dangers of leaving the Catholic Church and following the teachings of Lutheranism. As her fame grew, she received official legitimacy from Bishop John Fisher, Cardinal Wolsey, and even received audiences with Henry, who fully supported her teachings as they fell in line with his current campaigns against heresy. This was around 1528, for those keeping count. Yet by 1532, once the king's great matter had escalated towards a break with Rome, Barton fell out of favour. Hard. It might have had something to do with her prophecy that Henry would die if he remarried, and claims that she had seen the place in hell where he would languish for eternity. Naturally, the superstitious and proud Henry wasn't overly keen on this up-jumped servant weighing in on his political and theological debates, especially when such predictions amounted to treason, but Barton was still immensely popular. Royal agents began to spread rumours that she was sexually promiscuous, in league with the devil, and suffering mental illness, as well as inventing less popular prophecies and attributing them to her. Thoroughly smeared, Barton was arrested in 1533 and condemned by an act of attainder, and taken with five of her most prominent supporters to Tyburn, where they were hanged for treason, before being beheaded post-mortem. Needless to say, Henry did die after he remarried, but after his sixth marriage, 15 years after her prediction. Another notable prophet is mostly legendary. Much of her story comes from a pamphlet published in 1641, over a century from the time of the events it describes. Mother Shipton was supposedly a woman living in York during the reign of Henry, when she predicted that the disgraced Cardinal Wolsey would see the city, but would never reach it. Wolsey, who was en route to the Archbishopric of York for the first time in 16 years of being its Archbishop, heard about this prophecy and ascended to the Tower of Carwood Castle, roughly eight miles from the city limits. From here, he could view the city, and vowed that he would have the arrogant witch burnt at the stake for her heretical mumblings, 
sending three agents to interrogate the woman at her house. This is all in the pamphlet, which is of dubious accuracy. What is true, however, is that Wolsey was arrested at Carwood Castle on charges of high treason, and spirited back to London to face trial. He would never reach York, dying of an illness on the trip back down south. So far, the pamphlet only elaborates on events that had already happened, which makes predictions rather easy to fake, it has to be said. However, it goes on to record forthcoming events, such as the Siege of York during the Civil War, or the devastating Fire of London. Later publications on Mother Shipton appeared over the next few decades, with another pamphlet in 1642 describing her as the Sibyl of York, and a highly fictitious and slanderous record of her life produced by Richard Head in 1667, called The Life and Death of Mother Shipton. Head claimed that she was the daughter of the devil, born near a petrifying water well in the town of Knaresborough in Yorkshire. In this case, I mean petrifying in the sense of turns things, drops inside to stone, rather than just a particularly scary water feature. Head goes on to describe Shipton's appearance as phenomenally ugly, which I think is a bit rude, and attributed incredible powers such as levitation and telekinesis to her, as well as a number of fabricated prophecies on events that had already taken place, such as the following prediction. The Western monarch's wooden horses shall be destroyed by the Drake's forces. This, of course, alludes to the fate of the Spanish Armada of 1588, which was smashed in both storms and naval battles with Sir Francis Drake. Another pamphlet would appear in 1686, appearing to be based on Head's version of Shipton's life, stating that she had predicted the exact day and hour of her death, much like Nostradamus was said to have done. Various tourist attractions related to Shipton can be visited in Knaresborough, from the dropping well itself to a cave purported, but without any historical backing, it has to be said, to have been hers. When Henry popped his royal clogs in 1547, his son Edward would accede to the throne as Edward VI, at the ripe old age of nine. As we saw during the life of James VI, minority reigns are awful, and it was no different for Edward. The subsequent Regency Council, which sprung up to govern for the young king, was plagued with instabilities, from economic to religious to military rebellion. Firstly headed by the king's uncle, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, and then by John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, once Somerset was overthrown in a coup, the Regency Council was never far from turmoil. And this opened the council up to fears of witchcraft. There were still no large-scale witch hunts, rather the council was concerned with magical conspiracies. The regime of the Duke of Northumberland was particularly concerned with acts of treasonable magic, specifically those that prophesied the death or deposition of Edward or his ministers. In May 1551, a man called William Tassel had been arrested for casting figures and prophesying about members of the Privy Council, while in April of the following year, a former servant of the Duke of Norfolk, who had been rotting in prison since the death of Henry, was under suspicion of prophesizing, touching the King's Majesty and other noble men of his council. When his rooms were searched, quote, certain characters and books of necromancy and conjuration, end quote, were found. In June, a man known as Rogers was put in the pillory for sedition, after having repeated, lewd prophecies, and in October the Privy Council gave the order to search for prophetic books in the house of Leitzer, a man living in the city of York. Later the same year, after a wide-ranging investigation, several associates and family members of Norfolk's former servant were released from prison, although warned to beware of sorceries. We will never know whether these instabilities would continue when the Regency ended on Edward's 18th birthday, because he never made it that far, dying in 1553 at the age of just 15. Despite the wishes of Edward for Mary and Elizabeth to be disqualified from the succession, with the throne passing to Lady Jane Grey, the Marian faction within the court gathered around the daughter of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII, and deposed Lady Jane. Much like her father, and the Regency Council of her half-brother, Mary was ever aware of the dangers posed by magic, particularly those that prophesied her death. 
So when Princess Elizabeth asked her personal physician and astrologer, John Dee, to calculate both her own and Mary's horoscope, she got a bit annoyed. This was a serious act of treason. In theory, this act predicted the death of the Queen, which was a big no-no. Informed on by two men, Ferries and Prideaux, who alleged that both the princess and Dee had conspired to murder the queen through magic and poison, Dee was brought before the Star Chamber to face his charges. He did, however, manage to exonerate himself of these accusations, though, and once Elizabeth took the throne of Mary's death in 1558, he became a trusted advisor to the new queen. We will cover the fascinating life of John Dee next week when we cover the Elizabethan era, as well as the larger topic of English witch beliefs. Quite a short episode this week, so sorry about that. I'd planned out this batch of episodes in advance, and sadly Henrician, Edwardian, and Mari in England drew the short straw, but the next few weeks will be much more meaty, I promise. With the 20th episode of the History of Witchcraft and over 50,000 downloads, I've decided to launch a Patreon page. Podcasting takes up a lot of my time and energy and money in a period of my career where I have very little of each to spare. So if you're feeling particularly generous, please go to patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. Alternatively, leaving reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you find your podcasts is just as good a way to support the show. As a reminder, the intro and outro music was again provided by Sounds Like an Earful, and thank you again for listening. <laughs>